brothers do you recall when the grasslands reach to the horizon? And the deafening roar of countless wings overhead. Back when Rome was a village at Britain, the Emerald Island. Before we gave up on our future and buried our dead. Okay, so we are doing the Indus Valley Civilization today, and it is going to be kind of a, again, a convoluted topic, as majority of topics, um, you know, when you're dealing with ancient history tend to be. Um, and uh, I've used quite a bit of materials here. I used uh, Bushwhackers podcast series. I have used um, uh, Chess Easterny, The Hour of Truth, which is a program, also a Russian program uh, on Russian TV, Channel 365. I have used Marvine's material. I have used a bunch of other presentations and other people's materials. So I just want to send out a shout out to everybody whose material I'm kind of using. And just in general, the researchers around the world who are doing this stuff. Oops, I'm kicking my table here. This is um, a very unusual civilization. It's a civilization that is as mysterious as the rest of the ones that we have talked about, maybe even more so, because we know practically next to nothing about it. Uh, to where was the Indo-Aryans, Indo-Europeans, so we can at least reconstruct some of their belief systems and some of their society trends from their, from the societies that developed from theirs. So with the Indus Valley civilization, we are going to have a really hard time doing all that. And because their writing system has not been deciphered to this day, and it is believed that they did, in fact, have a writing system, we have a really hard time learning anything about them from their own, so to speak, mouth from their own point of view. So this civilization was originally discovered in the 1920s, 1921, 1922, when Harappa first and then Mahanshadaro were discovered. And these are um, large urban complexes, uh, Harappa being a smaller one. And majority of the, of the civilization's ruins are located in the area of modern day Pakistan and um, India, and you know, partially into the Tajikistan and Turkmenistan area. And uh, actually, it is a very large area that this civilization covers. It's, um, I translate it from kilometers, and it's uh, 684 by uh, 995 miles area. There's, it's believed that millions of people lived in this area. It's the largest Bronze Age civilization known. Mahanjadaro alone is believed to have had about 100,000 inhabitants. And uh, Harappa was a much smaller city than that. Um, it was only about uh, 61 hectares, but it still was a fairly large city for that time period. And uh, the whole civilization from start to finish, from its appearance to its complete collapse and abandonment of the cities lasted about 1,000 and a half years. So that's quite a long span for civilization to last. I mean, our modern Western civilization has not lasted nearly that long as of yet. And this civilization was just a little bit younger than the uh, Sumerians civilization, not by much. They were partially contemporary with the Sumerians, the early and the mid middle Sumerian civilizations. And it is believed that it collapsed at about the same time that all the great Bronze Age cultures went down. So the mystery of why it collapsed, we will discuss it a little bit towards the end, but um, it seemed that the entire Bronze Age world was going down about that time. And I'm going to stop for a second, see if anybody has anything to say. Because I'm determined to take pauses to breathe this time. <laughs> All right. So, um, so of course, India, we've got to remember that India is a subcontinent, right? And it was a subcontinent that was drifting uh, towards the, the rest of mainland Eurasia um, with its unique flora and fauna, with its unique wildlife, its, its unique climate and environment. And that its coll collision with the mainland was fairly recent in geological terms. And um, what we have there is a kind of a difficult forested terrain, especially if it was extremely forested back when the civilization first started blo blooming and appearing. And, um, and I mean, it's, it's still a fairly forested region, even though with an overpopulation situation now uh, that is happening in modern day India, of course, forests have been reduced significantly, but the wildlife, the abundance of various animal and plant species, some of them poisonous, some of them very dangerous to humans, was absolutely overwhelming at that time. You crossed the mountains and you went into a whole different world. 
I mean, it was a world that, that was much more, um, it had much more precipitation than it does today, especially Pakistan area. It was somewhat isolated from uh, mainland Eurasia. And it was a place where people came and they, um, well, I mean, it was populated really from the dawn of time. I mean, from the dawn of humanity, there were many species of humans. And unfortunately, the very going far back, you know, pre-homo species is not, has not been very well studied in India. It is known that there are some finds there, but the climate, the difficulty of access to some of the territories prevents um, paleontological studies. But it is believed to have been populated really since human species as such came out of Africa. And the climate is in, in a way very similar to Africa, but the wildlife there is not as adjusted um, to human presence as it was in Africa. So it was a very comfortable place for human beings to migrate to and to occupy. And when they came to that region, they pretty much stayed there. And it is believed that the population that originally settled that region was the same wave of migration that later settled uh, Australia and some of the islands that we talked about in some of the early episodes. And so who were these people? Um, these people were, um, well, we don't really know. It is guessed that they were related to modern day Dravidians. There's surprisingly little physiological remains, physical remains of these people. Well, no, there's a lot of remains, but most of them are in boxes and they're itty bitty chunks of bones and not much can be really told from that. It is believed that they were related to modern Dravidian population of South India. It is believed that they were not very tall. They were kind of gracile that they were dark skinned and that they in general were related to the modern day Australians. Um, like I said, the same wave of migration. Oh, Sri Lanka is another area where they believe today these kind of people live. Um, they think that the, the original civilization was formed from uh, several local tribes that may have even spoken different languages. Kind of at the point where these tribes came in contact with each other is usually where these big cities form, which is what happens is the agrarian population, the hunter-gatherer population, it gets torn away from its basically home base from its clan structure. And the people who settle the cities, they have to form a new community. And it's a diverse community where they have to learn to speak and understand with each other and kind of build their own new custom, customs for the cities where they now live. And so it creates a whole new modern kind of a society, modern, of course, for those times. So what language did these people speak? I mean, it is believed that it is possibly Proto-Dravidian language. Their writing has not been deciphered to this day. And I'm gonna show you real quick. So there, it's a very unique writing system that they had. And it has been analyzed. I mean, you see some of the examples. And what's interesting is that um, throughout this very large territory, it seems that the writing system was uniform. So it seems that at least towards the heights of the civilization, there was a uniform um, shared uh, writing system. There's about 400 symbols that have been discovered and uh, accounted for, but they have not been able to actually decipher them. And the reason why not is that they believe that this was possibly similar to the Egyptian writing system where you have pictographs and then you have some um, phonetic uh, symbols. So uh, for example, like the word category, right? You can say it by writing the word C-A-T or you could draw a little face of a cat and then a gory. So they believe that this might have been a compounded kind of um, writing system, and that's why it's very difficult to analyze even using co um, computer systems that we have today. But they do believe that it was possibly Proto-Dravidian and related to modern Dravidian languages. And analysis shows a structure, grammatical structure, that is similar to the Proto-Dravidian languages. They have been able to figure out that they were writing from right to left. Because oftentimes on seals, you know, when you write something and you run out of space, you have to kind of shrink down your letter sizes, you get to running out of room on your page. That's the similar sort of thing. Their artwork, again, very unusual society in the sense that we don't have any kind of um, large monumental um, architectural buildings in the sense, there's plenty of architecture, but none of it seems to be um, glorifying any sort of victories. It doesn't seem to be, you know, in Egypt, in Mesopotamia, you have statues, you have uh, various buildings that are palaces, that are blatantly temple structures. Here you do have areas that seem to be dedicated to worship, but not in the way that you would expect in a lot of these early cultures. They haven't found any monumental statues. What they have found is a lot of little um, statues. Let me pull those up, if I manage to. So they have found a lot of very little statues. 
um, with the meaning of them is not very well known. The best known of them, if I can get to it. So this is probably the most iconic, the best known one from this civilization. And it's uh, known as the king priest, though nobody has any idea to think that this, any reason to believe that this was a king or a priest. It's just they named that really in kind of association with the Mesopotamian cultures of the time that they were really contemporary with and living next door to. What else we find from here is a lot of seals, and a lot of these seals are not actually found on the territory of, uh, in this valid civilization, they are found in Mesopotamia. And we will get to that a little bit later when we get to the trade aspect, because this was definitely a civilization that was heavily engaged in trade and export, mainly export of various goods. And it seems that these seals, these signets, um, were used for commercial purposes to um, mark certain shipments to basically kind of used as little labels, as little signs of who was um, who was selling what, how much was attached. Um, there's a lot of symbology on some of these. We have seals kind of looking like these again. A lot of them use animal sim symbolism. A lot of them use um, this interesting symbolism of a person sitting in a, um, in a very specific uh, pose that we're going to get to. But it seems that they had a uniform uh, measure, measuring system. It seems that they had a fairly well-structuralized society. Their pottery is very unique because it is very pr proportionate. Uh, so, for example, if a vase is scaled a certain vase, let's say, the, let's say it's proportion, like a pot is scaled or an amphora is scaled a certain way, let's say it's two to three, then if they scale it down, they keep the same proportions, which indicates to us that they probably had an advanced mathematical system which is something that can also be seen in their city planning and in the way that their streets and their houses are uh, built, but we have no idea what mathematical system they were using. Very little military symbolism, and this led people to think that this is actually kind of was a very peaceful civilization. Well, there's a, not maybe military symbolism, it doesn't seem like they had a standing army attached to their cities, but it certainly shows that they had such things as spears, they had daggers, um, they had arrows, um, you know, they had bronze weapon production. So this may have not been very warfare oriented um, civilization, but it was certainly um, a civilization that knew violence and practiced human sacrifices, something we're gonna get to a little bit later on in religion. And um, let's see if I'm missing anything else. Yeah, and their city planning seemed to be very typed. Um, so their, their city, they, it seems that everything was very proportioned, very well, um, measured out and they seem to like uniformness in everything from artwork to their architecture to their measurements to everything else. So I'm going to stop for a second and see if anybody else has something to say. Almost all of our, the writing is on seals this big. About, an inch, about three quarters of an inch to an inch. Their bricks were standard size. Everything, uh, it's by far and away the most well-planned of the ancient civilizations. It's, it, it looks like it was just built, um, it didn't spontaneously evolve as somebody planned it, and which you don't have any real um, evidence of, of advanced social stratifications like palaces or or things like that flushing toilets sewage systems that wouldn't even happen anywhere to like Rome so so the the biggest thing about the civilization that we really have are the cities so I mean these cities were pretty incredible I mean they were very well planned out as David was saying the uniform bricks fired bricks they used a lot of bricks in their construction, so much bricks that they actually deforested the region quite heavily d during the life of the civilization. They had city streets that were running north to south, and they went as far as rounding the street corners in such a way that it would be easier for a car to turn without hitting those corners. They had multi-story apartments, apartment buildings um, with individual apartments, um, two to three stories. Uh, they had staircases lead, leading up. This was very advanced for their time. Flushing toilets, running water. Uh, they had um, groundwater, very advanced um, draining system. Of course, irrigation, which they needed to use quite a bit. Now, these sites were very subject to flooding. They had floods very commonly. A lot of these structures were reinforced 
specifically for the purpose of um, fighting the floods. And for example, Mohenjo-Daro during the duration of its existence has been flooded at least seven times. So this is a civilization that knew how to deal with adversity, knew how to deal with climactic and natural catastrophes, and they knew what to do in those situations. They recovered from those situations multiple times. They had really advanced trade. Um, they, first of all, they had very advanced um, seafaring and just uh, in general, you know, shipping routes. They went as far as Mesopotamia, all across the Persian Gulf. There has been some items found as far as Somalia. And in Mahenjadaro, I believe, bead necklace, that's pretty much identical to one that was manufactured, certainly manufactured on Crete. So the trade routes for this civilization were very, very advanced. But it seems like it was mostly geared towards export and not so much towards import because you find more of their trading seals really in Mesopotamia and the outlying regions than you do back in their home territory. As David said, this is a society that was not very stratified because all of these dwellings, they seem to be more or less uniform. You cannot really tell an elite from a non-elite by just looking at the city planning. Um, it seems like the way that the city works, so the city itself uh, was a citadel type city to where you have the main city and around the outskirts of the city, um, all around, well, not just outskirts, all around the city itself, you have fields and agrarian centers. So you had pretty much, and then all the really big public buildings, they were really ritual buildings. They didn't seem to be palaces that didn't seem to show much luxury for the people who lived there. Uh, they seem to be, everything seemed to be centered around group activity. So there's a suggestion that this may have been as a, you know, this society may have formed as a result of several agrarian communities coming together and having kind of an agrarian council rule rather than having a king or any sort of elite in place. Um, again, unfortunately, we don't know much about the writing of these people. So if hopefully, there is hope that it may one day be deciphered because we, of course, know a lot of the Mesopotamian writing systems and we have enough of a trade there that they may, we just may find a dictionary one day, hopefully, something like a Rosetta Stone for that civilization. So what did they export? They exported, first of all, they exported cotton. And cotton is something you don't domesticate to eat it. It's something that's pretty sophisticated. Uh, cotton is something that is also in high demand around the ancient world. Um, they had their own um, unique form of millet that they both used to feed their animals and they also used for their own um, you know, culinary needs. They um, tamed um, zebu, which is a kind of a local kind of cattle. And um, they also had other kind of, kind of uh, you know, various cattle, but they didn't really have horses obviously yet at this time. Uh, they also had lentil, barley, uh, did you say wheat? wheat, um, they exported a lot of ivory. They exported a lot of ivory because at that time, that region still was uh, home to a lot of wildlife that later pretty much got exterminated. Um, they, um, like I said, they sailed all across Persian Gulf, for sure, very advanced trading routes. Their society, it seemed that their cities were tied to rivers and they, their irrigation system were kind of a mixed blessing and a curse because on the one hand it provided uh, their fields with much needed water in the times of droughts, but then when you would have floods, all of a sudden that canal that you have dug out in order to irrigate your fields would flood and just wash you away. So they faced the flooding problems quite a bit. As I mentioned before, it seems like oftentimes these, these kind of cities, these sort of urban centers appear at the point of contact of multiple tribes where people come together and have to trade somehow. And so they probably first begin with little trading settlements that eventually grow into kind of cosmopolitan, cosmopolitan, cosmopolitan kind of centers. Um, and it seems like the city itself functioned as a one big temple structure almost in the sense that back in those traditional societies, every action that a person took throughout his or her day was ritualized. It, was, it had some sort of religious meaning. Everything from, you know, taking food, to brushing your teeth, to taking a bath. Everything seemed to have a significant ritual meaning. And because there's, there's evidence of water pools that are in the cities, that's what certain public structures that definitely exist. It seems that, and because of the flushing toilets, the running water, which was extremely unique. Again, such level of urban uh, comforts will not be achieved again until way late into Roman Empire. And in Europe, it won't be achieved again until late 17th, 18th century. 
I, it seems like there was possibly kind of a cult, a cultistic culture of cleanliness, and that water may have been one of the objects of, if not worship, then at least of sacredity, of kind of sanctity for the society. I'm going to pause and see if anybody has anything to say. Yeah, it's fascinating that, that they had indoor plumbing back then. So many, you know, what, a millennium ago? More than that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, then it was picked up again with the uh, with the Romans. <sighs> Scratching my head, wondering, you know, what kind of society was that? With all these modern conveniences that we enjoy today, that uh, they that the tools that they had in those days uh, weren't anything like what we have today. But yet they were still able to do that. It's fascinating. Yeah, absolutely. Anybody else? Yeah. I was going to say, I, I have to admit, I, I'm kind of uh, surprised to hear that they had, I don't know what t kind of flush toilet uh, that they would have had, but that's a new one on me. I didn't think that, I don't know if I'm coming through at all. This internet connection is really bad today. <laughs> yeah, you, you, you're coming through, Ryan. What, about, what I was going to say about the flushing toilets, when I say flushing toilets, of course, I don't mean our modern today's toilets where you can you know, pull a handle and it goes flush. Usually what it was, it was a kind of running water, an ongoing running water system um, to where it would just circulate it. So in that sense, but it was still a sewage system. It was a sewage system that was quite significant. I mean, if you have it going up the second and third story, that's, that's quite an engineering feat. Okay, I'm going to let David jump on for a second, guys. The Citadel itself would contain like granaries, ceremonial platforms, storehouses, and that kind of thing. But then around that, in the still in the city proper, would be houses of a mostly apparently traders and craftsmen. Uh, but within the walls, and then around that, you would have the agrarian villages and and homesteads and what have you. Their their sewage system. One of their cities um, had sixteen reservoirs holding, I believe, a quarter million cubic uh, meters of water uh, surrounded the city, but it was engineered in such a way, they were so good at hydroengineering, that uh, that would be 16 different layers, levels. And this allowed them to irrigate and water supply and all that, but they were really good at hydraulic engineering and uh, they had standard measurements uh, down to just a look like a, a millimeter and a quarter, which is by far the most precise measurements of any ancient civilization. I'm done. Okay, am I coming back through? Does anybody else want to say anything? Um. Just wanted to actually thank, uh, well, partly, David partly clarified, I think, my question about their hydroengineering. So basically their, their flush toilet, their, their water systems, they basically just understood all the dynamics of fluid dynamics in general, and that's how they dealt with their sewage and their waste, I take it? Yeah. Okay. Hope I'm coming through better now. Much. Much okay. better. Absolutely. The standard, and the standard measurement thing, that, thinking about it, that is a little bit surprising because how, how – about what time period are we talking about again? That's quite a long time ago. Um, we th we're talking about, this is right past Sumerian civilization. So 3200 BC to, to 2600 BC, mature, that's the early phase. The mature was 2600 to 19. Yeah, and then, yeah, their, their heights was 2600 to 19 BC. So really ancient stuff. They ended about 13. Yeah, they ended about 13. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. But, um, quick, quick question. Um, do we know if they had any uh, water filtration system like uh, charcoal? Is there any? No, I've seen no evidence of that from everything I've read. I've heard. I didn't hear anything about it. Uh, no. The, well, and when we get to the collapse of it, we'll see to where their water systems will play a really serious uh, role in their collapse, or potentially the fatal role. I mean, that's my personal little theory. Okay. But um. What was I going to say? So this is a society that clearly had, um, you know, access wealth, access food, and access resources. 
and it is a society that nonetheless i mean they had storehouses they had warehouses um, all along their cities there were a lot of these cities a lot of them this is not just one or two um particular archaeological sites these are, this is a network of like of southern cities a total that sites that they have discovered i mean and this is spread over a very vast region um and um the lack of luxury in the elites was very surprising because you really cannot tell where the elites were comparing to the normal people. You don't see a ruling class. You don't really see military elite as such. Um, and that is very surprising because at that time, you know, there was quite a bit of competition for resources and warfare. And it is possible that they were potentially partially kind of protected by the mountains that surrounded that region. And because the area itself was so unfamiliar and inhospitable to the surrounding peoples, in the sense of the, you know, the kind of the jungle, the climate, the very kind of difficult to traverse terrain. Um, and it is possible that um, their, um, get to my, and it is possible that their lack of uh, social stratification as far as wealth goes, that it might have reflected on their spiritual beliefs instead. It, it is possible that, you know, it is speculated by some, some scientists that it might have been a culture of asketism that you later see in Indian culture, even in modern days, that has become more much more pronounced. So it's possible that their stratification was less uh, physical, it was more spiritual, it was less material, it was more religious, that there were elites, but the elites were not um, separated out by material wealth. They were separated out by some sort of special behavior or special ritual purity, or something like that. Um, there, there's some, structures that seem to be like fire altars at least in some of the sites they seem to have uh, things like fire altars and i believe in mahenjadaro there's seven of those um in uh, another site uh the ganur Depe site um there's four of those so it seems like their main objects of worship really were natural forces such as fire such as water and that's all we, all of this we can just speculate we really don't know anything about their religious beliefs uh, other than what we can kind of guess from just looking at what vestiges of that culture potentially exist in modern day Hinduism. Um, they had the ritual pools. So again, the question whether washing rituals was there a kind of a culture of cleanliness. They definitely practiced human sacrifice. So that's speaking about a highly peaceful kind of uh, society. There's images of human sacrifices found on some of the seals that have been uh, recovered. And the Vedic texts and the Vedic texts are, are from the Indo-Aryans that came rolling over those mountains and into that region much later on. The, and they recall battles that a lot of, uh, you know, researchers interpret as battles between the Aryan tribes and the, you know, local population. And they describe their enemies as practicing human sacrifices. Um, there was a, it seems that they may have had a snake cult, at least in some of the tribes of the, for example, Tamil tribes um, of that Tamil region, region of India, which is sometimes associated with vestiges of the civilization. There's a very unusual cult of um, actually having a special relationship with the snake um, to where the snake itself is considered to be sacred. And there's special temples where people come to commune with the snakes. That may be something that came from that time. Um, and uh, there is interesting, um, in some of those tribes, there's some interesting stories about, um, again, that may be vestigial to this um, civilization. There's the idea of um, inner energy, special inner energy that a person carries. And we all know that from our new age kind of beliefs, but there's a special force, it's a fire force that a person carries inside. And for example, a king, uh, king's energy is so potent and it can be both negative and positive. But if, for example, if a king does not conduct himself correctly, and if he allows this energy to spill over in their belief system, it can literally run through the city streets and burn the city down in a form of actual physical fire. And that, that's possible that that's something that uh, tied over from that civilization. Um, things um, such as reincarnation, for example, things such as um, the idea of karma, they are not something that is inherent to the Aryan civilizations. It's not a Vedic concept, but it is very prevalent in today's Hinduistic beliefs. And it is possible that those concepts as well possibly arrived to us from that civilization from that far back. If you look right here, right in the top and the center and also the top on, well, at least it's on my left, you see this figure that is seated, right? And it's seated in a very specific pose. And that's a pose that we today recognize very clearly. And that is the yoga pose. 
it is you know undeniably the yoga pose and there is some speculation that yoga as a practice as a sacred practice that is currently very much a part of the hinduist tradition that it may have originated from that time as well or at least found its birth in. and you see also and here are some images of animals at that time again like i said the area was heavily populated by buffalo various kinds of um, um, rhino and multiple kinds of elephants um, tigers and those were the animal symbols that were oftentimes used in these seals so it seems that they've held those animals in some sort of sacred uh, belief that you see a lot of these uh, you see that those seated um, creatures uh, the kind of human uh, humanoid figures they are either male or female but they usually have the horned kind of deity and it is believed that that may be a representation of some sort of um, deity that was central to this tradition um, but there are some images where this deity is obviously being offered sacrifices to, and sometimes, like I said, human sacrifices. So let me see if I'm missing something else important about this. And I'll let David jump in because he has some more particular um, details. I just want to make sure I didn't miss anything important. Um, one thing that we know very well about the Indian culture, of course, is the fact that they have the cost of the Varna system. And I just, that's something that I failed to mention in the previous podcast, and that has less to do with the Harappa, the, you know, Indus Valley civilization, and a lot more to do with the Aryans. The Kasta system, the three-layer Kasta system, where you have, you know, your, um, basically your Brahman, in modern India, it would be your wise men, your priests, your carriers of knowledge at the top. Then you have your warrior class, and then you have your merchant slash people who work the land class. Some is something that Aryans took with them everywhere they went. We see it most clearly, of course, in India where it got layered and kind of stratified even more with the Varna system. But if you look at the Celtic society, you know, with their Druids, their warriors and their peasants, even if as far as you, if you look at the medieval society where you have the system where you have your priests, your knights and your peasants again, that is something that the Indo-Aryan tradition heavily carries with it everywhere it goes. And it's just something I wanted to mention last time and I failed to. But that system got extremely complicated when it got to India. And I think there's some debate that the Varna system, which is the subdivision of it, it's the idea of clean, clean versus unclean groups of people and the kind of separation of different social classes, even to the point where you have Varna of taxi drivers who drive Fords, I'm just exaggerating here, versus taxi drivers who drive Toyotas. I mean, that's gotten stratified to that degree. I mean, to the point point where today, oftentimes on social sites, dating sites in India, you know, they ask you how important those kind of divisions are for you. And sometimes people indicate that because it is important to socialize within that particular group, which makes India a very unique place to study because oftentimes groups intermarry within themselves. And the uh, that genetic um, kind of continuity is preserved within the Varnas um, to the point where you can almost trace it back to very antique times. Um, there was originally when this whole, when, when Mohenjo-Daro was discovered, there was some interesting finds. First of all, they found some bodies that originally they believed were people slain by the Aryan invasion. So there was this belief that the Aryans came rolling into this very blooming civilization that they ran it over, that they killed everyone, you know, left dead bodies everywhere in the middle of the city streets. And just it was a violent conquest. Well, that's not what it's looking like today. It's looking like the civilization itself was already in pretty severe decline by the time the Aryans came um, across the mountains. And what they met, rather than the blooming civilization at its heights, was really the vestiges of the civilization that was starting to fall apart and people were starting to return to their non-urban um, ways of lives, but still had some of the traditions. And it was originally believed that when the Aryans rolled in, they formed the upper classes of the society and that the Dravidian original population got pushed further south and kind of towards the bottom of the stratification of society in the newly formed Indo-Aryan um, society. Well, modern studies, both genetic and linguistic studies, show that that was not entirely true. Um, Art Artunov is a Soviet linguist. He's, I think, I don't know if he's still alive or not. He was quite of advanced years, a couple of years back, but in the 80s, they were con contracted by the Indian uh, Linguistic Survey and Ethnographic Survey. Uh, him and some of the Soviet, Soviet ethnographers both, uh, they were contracted to do kind of a vast uh, study of Indian population of different uh, territories of different tribes of different social classes. 
and they were checking their languages, but they were also do, doing some other, you know, ethnographic studies and some anthropomorphic, um, not anthropomorphic, <laughs> basically some phys physical measurements. And what they found is that they found an interesting thing that rather than having that division between the Dravidian and the, you know, Aryan um, at the top and Dravidian at the bottom, what they found was that there was three layers of population in India. There was what they called um, following Indian population and this is mostly the population of the mountainous tribes who believe to predate all of this uh, admixture. These are the people who came there in very early prior to the Bronze Age and have lived there prior to the Bronze Age and they have remained in fairly isolated locations. And these today these people are known as Adavasi and they are very much like Australian Aborigines. There are people who were very much discriminated against by various groups of Indian society and uh, they have not had a lot of access to the resources. They were pretty much limited to very hard to reach areas and very poor, um, it's kind of, the, uh, they are outside of the caste system completely, these tribal peoples, but they are considered to be the original people, the first people of that continent. Uh, then you have what they called the middle level Indian uh, population, and then they, what they call the new Indians. Now the new Indians, is the people who migrated there way past the Indo-Aryans. This is like much later migration, more or less modern. So what you have is that middle layer. Well, what they found in that middle layer of the Indian population, that there was more or less uniform distribution, really, of features, of skin color, of language. Um, and they found that even in the upper classes and the Brahmin classes of uh, Indian society, you really had an equal distribution of the, Dravid of the Dravidian and the Indo-Aryan features. So it seems that rather than a violent conquest as it was portrayed as through majority of the 20th century, this was a gradual admixture of two different peoples and that it was much more organic and kind of gradual process. Because what happened to this amazing um, civilization is that it started falling apart. I mean, it lived a fairly long time, but you know, it's 1,500 years but civilization is an absolutely ridiculous amount of time to exist. Um, so what made it fall apart? Well, before the Aryans even came by, um, the civilization started to fall apart and the scientists debated, there was again suggested that maybe it was a, you know, some sort of an ecological catastrophe. But the, well, well, or drought or some sort of thing. But the thing is like my, like I mentioned, my Hanjadara has been flooded at least seven times. This society had significant economic wealth and all the internal resources to really deal with any sort of natural disaster and rebuild, but they didn't do that. What we see instead, even though, okay, but there was, even though there definitely was an ecological disaster going on at this point in time, there was a climate change going on. Um, one of the rivers dried up. I will kind of go back to that particular river in a minute. Um, the, the irrigation has salted some of the soils around the cities, and so it was difficult to grow the same crops they were used to growing. And um, there was just the, the climate changes, everything else. But it took about 400 years. I mean, if you look at the different cities, some cities were still booming and blooming, while other cities started to kind of decay and start, started to fall in disuse. And um, they see other interesting things. For example, sewage suddenly got clogged up in multiple cities. And uh, when you have the you know, sewage that's clogged up in a city, I mean, think about what would happen to a modern city of that. I was, I was actually, I had a friend of mine who was a city worker sitting next to me while I was researching that. And he said, oh, well, if that happened, everything would be flooded with, for lack of a better word, poop. And then the city would become unlivable immediately and everybody would just have to move out. Because if the sewage stopped working and nobody was there to fix it, that city would become a cesspool pretty much for epidemics for all kinds of bacteria, it would become a very dangerous place to live, unlivable place. And it seems that's kind of what happened. The cities got abandoned. Suddenly you see a situation where in the middle, because they had such clean city planning, such very rectangular and very purposeful city planning, and suddenly you see houses built in the middle of what normally would be a street. It seems like people started building chaotically. City planning fell apart. Sewage stopped working. So it was, it was, really the city falling in complete disrepair and what they think happened is that um, for whatever reason um, the ideology the inner ideology whatever was the religious and the spiritual purpose of these cities because like I mentioned before these cities really served as, as a large organic temple something happened within the society where the beliefs that held that society together fell apart and one of the examples that, that's used for that kind of a collapse is the Mayan civilization Basically, to put it in very kind of 
cartoonish terms, you know, you cut people's throats and there's still no rain and you sacrifice more people to the gods and there's still no rain. Well, what do you do? The gods turned away from you, right? So there's no point in upholding this whole religion anymore because obviously the deities have abandoned us. Our sacrifices are not working. We're doing something wrong. Abandon the cities, move away, live a different kind of life. And so it seems like the elites moved away from the city, at least the wealthier layers of the society, whatever they may have been, we don't know. And what we had left behind is really the poor people who did not have much of resources to maintain these complex structures. An education system must, must have broken down and the kind of the social um, system, the ideological system must have broken down. And so most specialists believe that really um, it was a combination of uh, factors. I mean, between you know the irrigation system and the salted soils, between the climate change, between the severe deforestation, because these people burn ridiculous amounts of forest in order to just to build the boats, to to you know to build their buildings. And those bricks require ovens, you know, and uh, you know those ovens require fire, and fire comes from trees basically. So they deforested the area severely. They hunted animals pretty much to extinction. Um, they, um, there was a, you know, and there was a social and ideological breakdown. So what happened was a gradual fall apart of the society, the way people dispersed away and abandoned the city way of life. And um, they, there is an interesting um, kind of enigma uh, with this um, civilization. There's this uh, river that is mentioned in the, you know, the Vedic text, the Aryan text, and it's the Sara. Hold on, I'm going to try to pronounce it, Sarasvati River, which is a very enigmatic river. If you put the word Sarasvati into your search, you're going to come up with a deity. About five of them. Mm -hmm. Nobody knows where this river was. This was apparently a very major river. This is a river that played a huge role in the, you know, the early Indo-Aryan civilization and probably played a huge role in the, you know, the Indus Valley civilization. It's a river that went underground, that vanished, that dried up. Nobody knows where it was. There's several guesses where it may have been. Um, one of the su suggestions is that it may have been a river that uh, formed from the runoff of uh, the snow uh, that accumulated during the, the ice age and was continuously melting until it just there was no more snow to melt. And the river just dried up because in the later, later um, uh, Rig Veda, I mean, in Rig Veda, it's mentioned as an actual river, but in the later Vedas and other Hinduistic hymns, it's mentioned as that it's dried up, it's gone away, it's barely a tinkle kind of a little stream. So there's a deity that's associated with that river, but it seems like the original river disappeared and the deity got moved to different rivers as they different people migrated there because the goddess remained, but the river that it was associated with was no longer there. And so that's just one of those interesting phenomena where a name is associated with a, a geological location that is no longer there. And so people transfer it elsewhere. Anybody has any thoughts? Okay. Are there... Uh, go ahead. Yeah, um, so geologically, um, is, there, is there enough geological evidence to trace where a river would have come from or flown through where this water supply came from that they're dependent upon? There's several. The problem with that situation is that there are several guesses. One of the guesses, you know, in the 19th century was the, I'm going to try to pronounce this, was the Gar Harka, Gar Harka. I can't pronounce it, but there's several guesses. And from satellite imagery, you can see multiple of those river systems. And so they really don't know where it could have been. It's more or less kind of a mythological river that they believe had a geological origins to it, but they are not able to pinpoint it because there's several different river systems that dried up in that region. And it's hard to tell which one dried up when it might've just been on the ground. So yeah. I'm going to turn off my microphone so David can jump on without going bow, wow, wow. All right. Uh, just to speak on that, the Sarawati River has been identified with a river well to the north in Afghanistan that is fed by snow melt of the Himalayas, and that's referenced in the Vedas. Um, there is evidence, satellite evidence, of uh, the Gagahar Hakka, Hakra uh, system that it may have come, uh, that 
seismic activity may have shifted much of its water to the Ganges, which is is in further in southern India, and much more watered now. That may have been part of it. Um, the deforestation would, would have been a big part. The monsoons changed about 4,000 years ago when this civilization started to deteriorate. And um, this area now is mostly desert, or at least semi-arid, uh, where it, at, at that point it was considerably wetter, apparently. Um, it, it, between the deforestation and the, the salinity, and, and it seems like water, uh, the unpredictability of water, probably depending on monsoon seasons, uh, had a lot to do with it, whether it be from flood, floods early on, and towards the end of it, it was, uh, there's uh, the Thar Desert there now. Um, so there are several, have been several hydraulic uh, changes over, uh, there are several riverbeds that have changed course or, or became or went from perennial rivers to seasonal rivers. Um, so it's it's a complex thing. Um, also, there's evidence that death rates definitely went up, which that could be related to sewage. That could just be related to larger populations. Um, so it, it's hard to say. There, it, I'm certain that it was multi factors, and and human conflict probably played some role in that, but um, it, it was just, it seems to be, I would, I would argue that it, overall it was probably more of an ecological slash health kind of collapse than say a military one or something. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm back. Can you guys hear me? Mm -hmm. Yes. But, but to answer your question, uh, Nathan, that river is really, it's, it's almost a mythological, you know, periodically you will see publications. The location of the river has been discovered. And then a bunch of scientists will publish something else, say, no, that's not it. It's, it's one of those, it's almost like a ghostly river. It's something that exists in uh, epic texts and uh, is very hard to pinpoint physically. Sure, sure. It oftentimes happens in the ancient world. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, no, but, um, and, and I agree absolutely with, with what, what David says, you know, the, it's, it's a combination. It's not just one event. It's not just one thing. It's a combination. And, you know, it'd be fascinating. You know, you, you speak of, you know, at some point being able to find like the Rosetta Stone, you know, to start interpret and start interpret these writings and what they're writing about. And, you know, just, um, to be like like some of the, the the crops that you speak of that they're growing, uh, as as for instance cotton, um, that uh, requires a great deal of crop rotation. And did they understand that? And for and I would assume this is an assumption. I would assume that they would understand crop rotation to be as thriving and successful as they were for as long as they were. And if they were a uh, uh, if they were growing those kinds of crops, because if you don't know crop rotation, uh, rotation, you're not growing cotton very long. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you know, and here's the thing. I mean, and, and the a very good example of that we were talking about Arkaim last time. You know, and Arkaim is also. I mean, it's nowhere near the scale. Mm -hmm. But then you have the, it sets bunches of those little cities. And uh, I, I was actually speaking to the archaeologist who was responsible for the excavations. And they don't know whether there was uh, cities that coexisted at the same time or there were cities. Because when Arkaim, you know, in the previous podcast existed, it was basically a settled version of the nomadic lifestyle. So you would have a city and they would kind of run their mm -hmm. cattle around right. the city. Well, they think that might have been a case where they would just 
wear out the or the ground around. They would wear out the ecosystem. Yes. They would have to relocate their city to a different location. So that feeds kind of right into what you're saying because these people seem to be able to remain in the same exact locations for long periods of time. So they had to be sophisticated enough because considering their architecture, their hydraulics, their everything else, I mean, these were people who were super sophisticated to the point where when this, well, if you put any of these words, Mahenjadaro, Harappa, into, you know, your Google search, your first thing that's going to come up is, you know, nuclear war in the Bronze Age, uh, uh, you know, ancient aliens this, ancient alien that, because when this civilization was discovered, it was so above and beyond anything contemporary. Yeah. Even Crete, which had some pretty sophisticated, uh, you know, facilities, I mean, this civilization seemed to be just out of a different age, out of a different millennia even. It was so advanced and we know absolutely, absolutely. I mean, we don't even know what these people really look like. I mean, there's some guesses based on the residual population. And th what's really the biggest questions that the scientists have to ask is what happened to these people? Where did the civilization go? David's gonna jump in for a second. Yeah. Um. One more thing, 1300 BC is a critical date. Uh, throughout the whole intro, uh, the whole war, uh, ancient world or new world, uh, mainly because um, apparently bronze tin became really hard to get. And that broke down the metal uh, systems, the systems of making metal, and would basically usher in the Iron Age pretty quickly. Uh, but that you find that from Crete to Egypt to Mesopotamia, and it, this at the very end of this civilization, that was probably also the death knell. And we will get to the Bronze Age collapse once more because I want to cover all the other Bronze Age cultures because really right now we're just still at the beginning of the whole, because what we had at this time, I mean, towards the end of it was a glo globalized uh, world, you know, the Oikumena, as the Greeks would call it, you had all the, the, you know, early Greek civilizations, you had the Egyptian civilization, you had your Hittites, various Mediterranean, I mean, uh, 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 Mesopotamian civilizations, you had Harappa, you had Crete, you had this whole very complex, trading network, um, very far going. And you know, one, this is not a theory that is confirmed by any scientist. This is just my own thoughts. But anytime you have get globalization in human history, almost inevitably there follows a plague that usually layers on top of a multitude of factors. I mean, if you look at it, I mean, Black Death happened when the Mongols made the international trade, global trading possible. Before that, you had a huge outbreak of uh, uh, plague when, you know, uh, when the Byzantine Empire was just getting up uh, of its feet and you, they tried to create that kind of globalized network. It seems like anytime that people, humans in general, establish any sort of large trading network that goes far distance and fairly quickly, and you have at the same time large cattle involved, you have these outbreaks of plague. So I'm suspecting that on top of it, because when we will talk about this a lot more when we get to the Bronze Age collapse. I mean, it's attributed to the sea people, it's attributed to climate, it's attributed to warfare, it's attributed to a bunch of different stuff, but it happens so quickly and so uniformly to where these civilizations that were at their peak, you know, Hittites, you know, uh, Crete, um, the first iteration of Egypt, really, the Harappan civilization, they just all went pretty much down to the ground. And some of them went down to the ground to the degree we pretty much know nothing about them. For example, you know, we know nothing about, next to nothing about the Indus Valley civilization. We, thankfully we found a lot of texts with the Hittite civilization, so we know quite a bit about them, but until they were rediscovered, we really didn't even know who they were. There was just like some passing mention in the Bible. So this whole very developed, very advanced Bronze Age world just collapsed, that really did. And they were trading with Europe at that time. I mean, they were trading with the British Isles which was a source of tin even back then. I mean, there's evidence of them sailing as far as that to acquire tin for their bronze production. So we had quite an extensive trading network. But the biggest question, you know, that um, scientists really have, I mean, what did these people, because these people, it seems like they contributed very little um, knowledge-wise to modern civilization of any kind, even in, you know, in their home locality, even in India. The only vestiges of the civilization that we have, um, I mean, they obviously formed, population-wise, they obviously made a 
a large portion of what's today Indian population. They had mixed heavily with the new arrivals throughout Indian history and really have made up modern Indian peoples. Um, modern Hinduism ideas uh, such as karma, reincarnation, they are not in any way, shape or form Vedic ideas. These are unique to that re region. They're very prevalent in that region and it seems that they have, may have originated from those people. The concept of inner energy, you know, of chakras and all of that stuff may, again, speculatively have originated from those people. It is fairly unique to that civilization. Uh, yoga is a practice um, which ties into all those concepts where yoga is really not a form of exercise. Yoga, yoga is a form of religion. When yoga originally spread throughout Eastern Europe, um, you know, various Eastern Orthodox churches outlawed it as a competing religion because Yoga is not about exercise. Exercise is just a means of achieving a means of achieving enlightenment. It's really it's a spiritual religious practice, and that is something that may have its roots as far back as all that. But the biggest question that the scientists want to know the answer to, and they don't, is why is it why is it that this complex mathematical system, this amazing urban planning, these technological capabilities, uh, this uh, trading capabilities, the social organization, city planning, um, everything. Uh, why, why did it, why no, none of that was in any way, shape or form integrated into the future civilizations that rebuild themselves in place of this one? And one of the answers to that question may be that if there was an ideological and religious collapse, if the belief system, if people felt that the deities failed them, that their very belief system was not sufficient to provide them with a livelihood, if their gods were no longer there to protect them or their way of worshiping these gods, was no longer effective. They may have just um, thrown out kind of the whole system because if the cities functioned as kind of complex and large uh, temples and the, those temples stopped working, why practice that kind of behavior anymore? At that point in time, people might try something new entirely and turn away from those practices. So that's the only speculative um, answer we might have to what happened to the civilization and why it did not really leave much of a, you know, by the way of knowledge, by the way of influence behind it, as far as its amazing, truly amazing post time period achievements. That's pretty much everything I had on this, and I think I'm dead on time today. Mm -hmm. Anybody has any comments or thoughts? I was just going to mention I earlier, um, you know, talked a little bit about it. it might have been, you know, multiple things kind of all at the same time that would have caused such an incredibly advanced civilization to basically collapse. And I'm guessing just from what you went over that there might be a lot to that. In fact, there, there might've been, well, okay, maybe the climate changed and maybe the soil became, you know, too salty and you have trouble with this and trouble with that. And then maybe the sewage breaks and then maybe you also have a plague and then, you know, losing faith in your uh, spiritual beliefs right on top of that could be the proverbial straw on the camel's back because eventually, yeah, you, I mean, you just keep doing the same thing over and over and it gets worse, you're probably going to just give up at some point, especially right. when you're just dying like flies, perhaps, if that, if that is what happened. I don't, I don't know myself. It's just a speculation. Right. Well, and you know, it's kind of like, the, I mean, because the, the general cycle of any civilization, I mean, is, is estimated, um, you know, lose is somewhere around 1,000 and a half uh, years. And this, it, it, that's about the time when any civilization kind of exhausts its in, in inner resources. And that's when oftentimes it just comes to decline naturally. And it's possible that it just it, it reached old age. I mean, it just mm -hmm. ran, ran its course and it died out, more or less. Um, I mean, I have a lot of questions. Um, by the way, those corpses that were found in the middle of the street, what turned out to be is that there were different layers. So the streets were built after a cemetery was already there. So th those corpses that were found that they originally thought were a result of an invasion or some atomic warfare, they were actually just normal cemetery burials. And then later on, you know, as the city continued, the new layers build on top, with, they build a road on top of the cemetery, which oftentimes happens in this sort of situation. But I have a lot of questions. I mean, I, ha I, I want to know, I mean, you know, the same team, the same linguistics team, uh, Russian linguistics team that is responsible for deciphering the Mayan writing system, they worked really hard on trying to decipher um, the Harappan um, and the Indus Valley writing system. And they came pretty close, but they, the problem is, like I said, if it's, when you have a composite writing system, um, as they think this may be, it's very, because some symbols might mean concepts that I used, when you use a picture for a cat to make the sound cat, 
and then you add on syllable syllabical symbols and then you add on individual letters it's, it's almost impossible to decipher without having some sort of a translation tool without having a Rosetta Stone which is why we're so incredibly lucky to have the Egyptian system deciphered otherwise it would have not been possible so they're really hoping that maybe one day we'll be able to decipher this their writing system because at least it will give us some idea of what they believe what they call themselves what what these things meant to them yeah are uh, most of the artifacts, most of the um, that they're uh, that have been found, because uh, you mentioned that um, it's uh, they're, they're they're so far flung through their trading network. Are most of the artifacts that they're finding are they uh, s sourced to the site of these cities, or are they being found outwards in their trade areas? Outwards. So there's more artifacts found outside of the city, cities. So for example, if, than they are inside. So it seems like the civilization was fairly, I mean, this is again a complete guess, but it, just looking at the distribution of artifacts, it seems like they were more likely to trade outwards than have somebody come into them, mm -hmm. into their territory. Hmm. So, and, and another thing that I, to me is fascinating about civilization, we don't have large statues. We don't have large bare reliefs. We don't have, um, complex, you know, monumental buildings, as far as, you know, something that is clearly, an, you know, place of worship or centralized authority. We don't have anything at all indicating any sort of centralized authority. And as far as, you know, King's Palace, or I don't know, uh, warlords, I don't mm -hmm. know. We don't have, um, we have ETBT things that are about this big statues that are this big, and we have almost no physical remains of the people. I mean, at last count, there was something like 40 skeletons total. I mean, and uh, for those, I mean, out of other remains, they have pieces of bones, these, this big, I mean, there's stacks and stacks of boxes and museums that have like little itty bitty fragments of bones. And the only way I can explain that is that the climate at the time when this civilization flourished was not nearly as dry as it is today. And I mean, just the, compos the composition rates. Another thing about this culture that is very different from modern day India, they did not practice cremation. They actually buried their dead which again makes you know it's very strange that we have so many. and the only way you can explain it is really the climate i mean uh, weather regions it's just it's really hard to pre preserve any sort of um uh, any sort of organic remains and it's possible that maybe they had beautiful paintings and wonderful rugs hanging all over their tapestries hanging all over their you know building walls that told us their stories and their legends but they were written on pretty much some sort of organic material that something like parchment like for example like the entire mongolian empire for the longest time it was believed that they were more or less illiterate until it was found you know in china some the you know the imperial mongolian archive was found that was written on well chinese paper and mm -hmm. that stuff just goes poof and instantly so if they made most of them maybe they made all their monuments out of wood i mean they had access to plenty of forest we don't know we just don't and there's and there's very little mention of them in other cultures. That's another interesting thing, which is another thing that makes me think that they were kind of close society, more or less, that they traded outwardly, but were not particularly welcoming to visitors. There's mm -hmm. some mentions in the Sumerian text that they sent some scouts out and that these scouts came across these cities, but not enough, a lot of description as, who to, as to who these people were. Hmm. So, very strange. Well, yeah, 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 it's, it's, it's that, that you have cities that long established mm -hmm. in, and uh, if you will, the city is living that long and you have such little fossil evidence of the human population. So where did they go? You know, what do they do with them? Yeah, well, that's, and that's, that's one of the many, many questions with this civilization. Yeah, 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 lot, lot, yeah lots of questions. Yeah. David, is jumping in real quick? There is some evidence, well, am I a, Answer that question and then answer another. Um, or try, excuse me. Nobody can answer these. There's some evidence that they may have buried their bones. Like like some native tribes mm -hmm. did. Leave your bodies exposed until the yeah, 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 basically sky barrel where crows and stuff come and jackals or whatever and uh, and then there's the little pieces of bones that re remain uh, other thing you were talking about artifacts um, there's lots of toys carts and and 
things like that, uh, or what they think are toys, and um, figurines which are comparable to like ancestor shrines or, or little mother earth goddesses or something like that. Those you find in some of the cities, but you don't find much more significant than that. Uh, but they were, like I say, they're cities uh, which could be up to 50 or 100,000 people were mostly populated by craftsmen. Uh, they had massive beadworking from the Neolithic. Uh, and those were almost certainly for trade. But um, you don't see a lot more than that. It's, it's really strange. And they, they were such a seemingly egalitarian civilization. Um, it, it's really strange that it didn't, with the collapse, that it didn't, more of it wasn't preserved. Uh, especially if writing was actually a language rather than, some people speculate that it might be a, like a symbol system, but they really don't know. More than likely it was a language. I think. But that, again, people have been trying to figure this out for more than a hundred years and it's still more mysteries than anything else. So, and I, w I was just going to say, you know, was, you know, and it, it is strange, but on the, on the other hand, I mean, the reason why we know so much about Egypt, because Egypt, if this was, a, because Egyptian society, because that's what we're going to do next, Egyptian society was similar in the sense that if you, if you leave the pharaoh out of the picture, if you just take the majority of the Egyptian population, I mean, this was almost like David said earlier, it was almost like a communist, idealized, communist, socialist type society to where everything seemed, there seems, seemed to, to have been a culture of, you know, not no access of no excessive wealth, no excessive luxury, no excessive showiness. And um, Egypt was that way in the sense, of, but in Egypt we had this figure of the Pharaoh, which symbolized all of the people. And so all of that showiness, all of that luxury, all of that wealth went towards the figure of the Pharaoh. And Egypt also had the great culture of the afterlife. Well, these people did have seem to have the same culture of afterlife. And so if they had that, that sort of ideology of, you know, Everybody should be very moderate. Everybody should be very reserved. Everybody should be very, um, you know, should not, you know, indulge themselves in excessive wealth or excessive anything else, construction. Then, I mean, that would make sense why they would not leave a lot of, like I said, but for all we know, they carved them amazing wooden statues that just went, de deteriorated and went away. But yeah, this is one of those most mysterious civilizations, really. No, just my final question is it, it, it just seems like, the, uh, to use a phrase, like the, uh, the place got looted. Yeah. Or it just got looted and walked away with. Possible. And yeah. where where did it go? Yeah. Ryan? I was just going to say that obviously, um, um, if it is true that it was a very, very, uh, if it was very plentiful in water, um, you know, earlier on before the climate of that part of the world changed, yeah, I could really see a lot of things deteriorating, even including a lot of uh, material like bone, uh, because bone, if you have it in the right, and you have you have it, you have bone in the right environment, uh, bacteria do like to eat it up, and that would account mm -hmm. for a yeah. lot of missing skeletal remains, as well as wood and other organic materials. So that could explain part of it. Right, because I mean, in modern day, I mean, in any sort of tropical kind of moist, uh, you know, climate, uh, I mean, stuff just rots away in no time at mm -hmm. all, evaporates. Uh, so, I mean, yep. So this is probably the last of the civilizations that are really, uh, we have very little information on. Um, all right. Well, thank you everyone for who was here and I'm looking forward to seeing you next Wednesday. I'll send out a reminder. All right. Thank okay. you very much. Thank you. Bye. Yep. Thanks to everybody, especially you, Julie. Everybody be well. He is good. Be well. well. Cheers. Bye. that exist within every man's soul. Every man's and we will live forever.
forever or as long as stories are told. We are the archetypes that exist within every man's soul.